these albums specifically, I had to think of it like these could be the last two albums I ever put out into the world. And am I okay with that?
Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? I'm Shelby Lermo. I play guitar and sing in the band Ulthar. And Shelby, how would you describe Ulthar? How would you describe your music? Ulthar is a heavy metal band. We try to remain somewhat unconstrained by genre or subgenre labels, but people most often classify us as black and death metal. Unconstrained by genres, but would you say that Ulthar is mostly fast? Mostly, yeah. We like to slow it down too. We don't try to put too many rules on ourselves, but I think we have, we've tended to speed up and get a little more technical and crazier over the years. I think there was more doomy, sludgy stuff on our first album and then less on our second and even less on our third. And you don't mind Ulthar being referred to as technical? No. I think I think we're a pretty technical band, but I, I think we sort of stand apart from most technical death metal bands because of our more chaotic elements, whereas technical death metal bands sort of, you know, within that genre tend to be very clean and produced, and we try to avoid that. So technical chaotic mostly fast mostly not clean yes would that sum it up yes okay <laughs> great and as far as how Ulthar came together how did that happen how did you guys get together and what were your intentions at the time it's a pretty pretty simple story you know not not much different from most bands i was i was i was living in the bay area in 2013 2014 and I knew Justin, the current drummer for Ulthar. He, he lived in New York at the time, but I knew him from booking shows for his old band, Mutilation Rights. And he moved, he moved to Oakland in late 2013. And I just knew I wanted to play music with the guy. He's a killer drummer. He's a hard hitter. And so we started jamming around and then, you know, we knew we needed a bass player. So we hit up Steve Peacock, who is the current bass player still. We've always just been a three piece, same three people the whole time. I mean, you know, Steve was down and that's pretty much it. From the beginning, we started doing, we started doing sort of more simple DB kind of stuff, but we grew out of that pretty fast. We had, we had too many ideas to, <laughs> to stick with that format very long. And as far as the sound that you described and the sound that people associate with Althar now, how long did it take for you guys to arrive at that sound? I, I think it was, it didn't take long. I think by, <laughs> you know, I, we, we had a demo that came before, a five song demo that came before our first album. I think by the fifth song, you can already hear the direction that, or the path that we're still on. I think that our, our first album, Cosmo War, that came out in 2018, it's a little sloppier and less refined than our, our current stuff but it sounds like the same band i don't think we've i don't think we've deviated too far from from how we've always sounded okay and how do songs come together for you guys it's changed over the years we early on well we were a bay area based band so we had a practice space and we would basically write songs in the practice space, come in with maybe a riff or two and bounce them off each other, put songs together. In the last couple years, Steve moved to Portland, Oregon, and I moved to Virginia, right outside of Washington, DC. So we compose all of our music remotely now. Steve and myself pretty much split the songwriting half and half. We, we write the songs out, we, we tab the songs, you know, we write it. We write our songs on paper and send them to each other and demo our songs and yeah, compose remotely. And then a couple times a year, we'll fly out to Oakland and get together and run through everything and learn them together. So we, it's changed a lot over the years. Sorry, did you say that you write songs on paper? Yeah, like tablature, you know. Okay. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't do that. It's, through through the need to to you know teach riffs to each other we myself and steve we both basically learned to write music so that we could we could teach each other songs remotely how long did it take for you to, to learn that 
Not long. I mean, it's, I use a program. We both use a program called Guitar Pro that's pretty commonly used with musicians. And I, I started learning it at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, when I had a ton of time on my hands. So actually, Anthronomicon, the, our, our most recent album, our, one of two albums, was the first, the first time I'd ever uh, sung in music on paper. It was the song Saccades, which is off Anthronomicon. So I don't know. It, it was pretty easy to learn. I, I've been playing music for a long time. I just, it was just a matter of changing how I thought about it. And I, I learned it within a month or two, I guess. And this process of, of trading guitar tablatures, did it affect how you thought about the songs themselves? Like, you know, does your approach to, to song structure change? Did your, your riff writing change? Yeah, I think I think it definitely did just in that it, it made me look at the songs in a more a more detailed and mathematical way. I don't know, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but we we put it together in the studio. We we never really wrote anything down. It was just a matter of remembering everything and playing it. And I went through the process recently cuz we got together as a band in California a, a couple of weeks ago, we got together, I flew out there and we rehearsed for a couple of days. And so in preparation for that, I went back and I was tabbing out our old songs, going back to songs off Cosmovore and, you know, putting those on paper for the first time. And it was this funny experience of being like re-experiencing the songs through, through looking at them as a series of notes and time changes and tempos because, you know, I never really thought of it that way. It was just a, an organic thing coming out of my hands. So it's, it's weird. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's, it's a more, yeah, it's a much more specific way of writing music. I feel, I, I don't know. I'm glad I learned it and it's, it has definitely changed the way I write. I write music for all my music. I've actually never used Guitar Pro. Do you, are you also able to record or is it just tablature? you so guitar pro you can you can play back the music as you're tabbing it out so it gives you sort of an 8-bit nintendo sounding version of your song okay but what i do is so kind of like a midi yes exactly and what i do is i when i write a song i export it as a midi file and then i import it into this is some nerd shit <laughs> i import it into logic pro that's that's the other name for this podcast some nerd shit <laughs> yeah if you want to get into some nerd shit i'm here for it but yeah, I, I start with all my songs as MIDI and I program drums to the MIDI and then I record live guitar over the program drums. And that's how I that's how I put songs together. That's basically how I do it for for all of my bands. Play whatever you want over this. This is just like the program drums are what what I hear in my head, you know. Gotcha. I try not to be too much of a tyrant about it. But besides the, the MIDI guitars, do you also record with the DAW? Do you record your own guitars, your own guitar demos and send them to your bandmates? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, with the three of you guys living in three different cities, I'm sure there's a lot of file sharing, right? Going back and forth? Yes. Yeah. And this is this is new for uh, this latest, or the latest two releases since you moved? Yeah, this was our, our first time doing it this way was on these two new albums. Providence, our last album was kind of like kind of a half and half thing where we were we had already started kind of going in that direction just because we were all really busy with other projects we were me and steve were like writing songs at home and then and it all kind of came together while we were recording the album so even though we were all living in the bay area we were kind of already moving this direction but um yeah anthronomicon and helionomicon the two new albums are the first time that we did everything completely remote, like thousands of miles away from each other. You know, this is a, <laughs> this is a strange question, but I mean, composing remotely, putting together songs through tablature, did the finished album surprise you? Or were there elements of it that, that came out differently from what you expected or what you envisioned? Yeah, there was definitely a lot of room for, for tweaking things. And yeah, just sort of like bending ideas here and there. For so when I say we split the songwriting down the middle, I, I mean very literally. I you know, Anthronomicon is an eight song album, Helionomicon is a two song album. I wrote four of the songs on Anthronomicon and one of the songs on Helionomicon, and Steve did the same thing. But 
Steve, the way that Steve does his songs, he does it slightly different for me. He doesn't program drums. He just, you know, he records to just a click track. So when we got to this, the recording studio, there was a lot more room for creativity with the drums, I guess. Even though we kind of rehearsed all the stuff already, the songs, especially his songs, got a lot more fleshed out in the studio. Whereas my songs, like I, when I record the demos, I record two guitars and bass and I program drums. So it's pretty close to the finished product already. But Steve's songs are a little more bare bones. So they really got fleshed out more in the studio. And of course, we hadn't performed any of the vocals yet before we get that was just like a very improvisational and kind of cool hearing it all for the first time, you know. And I believe you said that you started working in this method on, on Providence. Did you guys also split the songwriting for Providence down the middle in the same way? Not, not as exactly down the middle as on these albums, but pretty close. Like there was a, there was a couple of songs, the song Furnace Hibernation, me and Steve both split up the songwriting on that song. It, yeah, it was pretty close, but not, not as, as exactly 50, 50 as the new albums. I'm curious, how would you, how would you describe Steve's style in terms of riff writing or songwriting to your style? Steve is, Steve is a little bit more loose and maniacal uh, than <laughs> I am. I'm, and this is like, this is, is even like boils down to just what our personalities are like. <laughs> I'm kind of a neat freak and Steve's kind of a maniac and his, and that I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing at all. I've told people, I think Steve is a superior songwriter to me. He's an amazing musician and just a crazy human being, but he, you know, he has another band. He has a solo project called Pandiscordia Necrogenesis. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's, it's a one man black metal band, but he performs live as a one man band where he has a kick pedal on one foot and a snare on the other foot. And he plays guitar and sings all at the same time. And he improvises all of it. And it's some of the best riffs and best vocals that you'll ever, ever hear for a black metal band. And it's just flowing out of his head. You know, it's like, he, he just, he's like a black metal like jazz musician the shit just flows out of him whereas with me i'm much more i think i'm much more calculated and i like to take my time and look at shit mathematically another example i like to give people is if me and steve just sit down next to each other and open our laptops the my desktop has one neat row of folders that all my projects are in <laughs> and steve's desktop is you literally can't see what his screensaver is because it's just covered with folders and files and shit everywhere. <laughs> so I think that that's, I think that's a good example of just like the differences in, in our approaches. But I, and I think that that's what, I think that that's kind of the magic behind Ulthar is it's, it's simultaneously very structured and calculated, but also very chaotic and insane. And I think like we were talking about, you know, the technic technicality factor, that's why we don't sound necessarily like the standard quote unquote technical death metal band is there's this element of unpredictability and chaos behind things that's that you can hear in the music.
So let's talk about these albums. Yeah. Anthronomicon and Helionomicon mm -hmm. are the third and fourth Ulthar albums, and they were released simultaneously on February 17th through 20 Bucks Spin. Let's start with the titles. Anthronomicon, Helionomicon, am I correct in saying The Book of Man and The Book of the Sun? Yes. And before we get to the concept behind the albums and why you decided to do two albums, were these meant to be listened to in any particular order? Not necessarily. I, there's, I, I think for me personally, I recommend starting with Anthronomicon. And if you enjoy it and feel like you digested it, then dive into Helionomicon because it's a much more challenging listen, but also more rewarding, I think. But, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody how to listen to our music. I think <laughs> people should do it however the fuck they want. So, yeah, that, I, I have my take, but I, I'm, not, I'm not telling people to do it that way or anything. It's just the way that makes sense to me. Helionomicon being the more challenging listen because it's two 20-minute tracks, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, <laughs> were these... I'm guessing these weren't meant to be played simultaneously. No. You mean like at the same time, like a flaming lip? At the same time, yeah. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> that, would, that would have been much too complicated. <laughs> I, I wish we were... So this isn't like a Times of Grace, Grace kind of thing, right? No, no. Right, okay. So let's talk about the concept behind the albums. Book of the Sun, Book of Man. What, what is the theme and what links these two albums together? I, I don't like to go too deep into the meanings of things with Ulthar. I, I'm not, I'm not going to straight up... <laughs> sure, sure. You don't have to explain the songs and, and the concept. I'm just curious. Yeah. Right, right, right. But I'm, I'm still. I'm, I mean, obviously, there's intentionality between, or there's intentionality to you releasing two albums at the same time that have similar naming conventions, right? And something ties the two two albums yeah. together. Yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to just dodge your question. I'll still answer the question. I, I'm just, I'm just letting you know as as a as a general rule, I don't really like break down the meanings of our songs. I like people to read the lyrics and try to figure out for themselves. But as you said, Book of Man, Book of Man and Book of the Sun, we were kind of approaching it from the beginning because we, we conceptualized these albums together and basically executed exactly what we conceptualized in the first place. There was, there was very little straying from the path over the, the three year course of, of writing and recording and releasing these albums. But yeah, it started off as like the first album is going to be about mankind and the second album is going to be about the cosmos and how they relate to each other. And as time went on and as we worked on the songs more and as we wrote the lyrics, those concepts, concepts started getting kind of farther away and we started kind of branching off and writing about different weird stuff. So there was, there was a basic idea that we sort of strayed from during the course of, of creating the albums. But we did, you know, we kept them aesthetically similar. We wanted, we also had the idea of doing the artwork as you see it, like it's one, it's one large piece of art that's split down the middle that makes up two album covers. We wanted to have that sort of like aesthetic connection between the two albums while, while still maintaining them as, as separate releases and if, you, if you've seen the packaging at all like there's kind of a light and dark thing between the layouts of the two albums there are aesthetic themes especially that that run between the two albums if not as much lyrically gotcha from what you told me it sounds like you you envisioned this originally as two different albums yeah yeah from from day one that was the idea and when we came up with that, we were like, there's no way that 20 bucks spin is going to go for this idea. And much, much to my surprise, he was like fully down for it from the beginning. And I think, I think it worked out pretty well. I mean, so far it seems to be working out pretty well. Like he's Dave at 20 bucks spin has told me like the albums are pretty much, you know, selling equal to each other you know people people are buying both albums in in the same amount so 
it seems to have worked out for everyone. Well, that's that's actually something I, I wanted to ask you. I mean, these were obviously meant to be released together, and they're they're complementary albums. Why the choice to release them separately, as opposed to like a double CD or a double? You know, we just wanted to do something different. That was that's kind of the expected way to do things, and also we just saw these two albums as their own separate artistic statements. I think that, yeah, the approach on Anthronomicon and the approach on Helionomicon are very different. The music does have, you know, it, it all sounds like Ulthar, but they are two separate statements, separate enough that I feel that they should be sold as two separate albums, even though there, you know, there are similarities between them. And yeah, I mean, what it boils down to basically is that, you know, we, we just wanted to do it differently. We were a band that does stuff differently and likes to take chances on stuff. So that's, that's why we did it. And as far as the, the two long songs on Helionomicon, what were the challenges in composing those? And how did you, how did you set out to, in terms of song structure, to, uh, to map out what you wanted to do on those songs? I mean, the, the challenges are basically exactly what you, what you would expect. You know, writing, writing a technical death metal song that's 20 minutes long is, it, it's very challenging just to, just to come up with that much material and try to, try to keep it fresh and interesting and keep it from, you know, bogging down or getting tiresome. It's, it's really hard to, to write a song of that length that, like, keeps keeps the right pace and keeps the listener's attention. And I think we accomplish it, me and Steve, in, in different ways. But it just gives you so much space to to connect disparate ideas to each other and kind of indulge every weird idea you have within the same song. It's it's It was really fun <laughs> writing that song. And the way I approached it, I won't go too much into the the math of it but it for me it was sort of a numerological mathematical experiment i like to say the song is sort of constructed like a pyramid anthronomicon is the song that i wrote of the two longer songs and yeah i sort of built it like a pyramid and i won't explain that too much because i think it might be fun for people to listen and try to figure out what i mean okay there are atmospheric elements on both albums. Were those atmospheric parts meant to tie the two albums together, or uh, was it just something that you you guys felt you needed to, or felt you it's wanted to experiment with? Yeah, that's something we've always done. All of our all of our albums have had those atmospheric elements to them. So I don't think I don't think it necessarily connects Anthronomicon and Helionomicon in any profound way. I think all of our albums connect because because they share that same element you know what i mean and that and that, i think that that's just i mean we're all three of us in the band are fans of ambient music and electronic music and you know prog rock and that's it's just something we all have interest in and we all that's something that we that we all work on you know certain interludes i made certain interludes steve made certain justin actually our, our drummer justin actually did most of the interludes on on anthronomicon okay yeah at what point in the process do justin's interludes come in is he working on them at, at the same time you guys are working on uh your songs yes yeah we we when we showed up at the recording studio believe oh no we hadn't entirely finished them I think they were mostly finished. No, it was actually, he hadn't finished them until, he finished them after we finished recording the album. I think he was already working on them, but maybe he had some done beforehand, but I, I feel like he was working on them after, after we'd finished tracking the album and we're like through the mixing process and stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. Where did you guys actually end up going to record this? We went to a studio called Developing Nations up in Baltimore. So our first two albums we recorded at Earhammer Studios in Oakland, and we had a great time working with Greg at Earhammer. We've all 
all three of us in the band have recorded several albums with Greg. He's he's an awesome engineer and even works as an uncredited producer on a lot of stuff. He's just like great engineer, good guy, knows when an idea isn't working and will even, you know, suggest something better that always works. So Greg's awesome, but we decided to go with a different engineer, Kevin Bernstein. Justin and Steve flew out and stayed with me in Virginia for like 18 days or something like that. And I I live about an hour away from Baltimore. So we would drive up every day. We would spend eight or 10 hours in the studio and then drive an hour back home. So it was 15 days straight of, of long days in the studio with, you know, an hour of driving at each end. So it was, it was a pretty exhausting process. And we just barely finished on day 15. We were in the studio at like 10, 10 PM on the 15th day, wrapping things up. So it was like, we barely snuck in under the wire to finish these albums. And this is your first time working with Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have worked with him a little bit since he recorded just the drums on on this side gore grind kind of band I do called Human Corpse Abuse. I recorded it all at home and then he recorded the drums at his studio and then I mixed it all back here. But yeah, I've worked with Kevin a little bit since and he's he's awesome. He's worked he's done a bunch of stuff with like Full of Hell and Outer Heaven and a bunch of awesome bands. He's he's a really cool guy. He also builds guitars. He builds aluminum guitars, which is a pretty crazy hobby to have. Why Kevin? Why did you choose to work with Kevin? He's, he's an old friend of Justin's actually. Justin, like I said, Justin used to live in New York. He was an East Coast guy and had recorded with Kevin like a decade, 15 years before. And we'd actually stayed when we'd been on tour before in Ulthar, we, we stayed at Kevin's house twice, I think, and like saw his studio and yeah, early in the, in the conceptual phases of these albums, Justin said he really wanted to work with Kevin. And then it ended up, it was kind of like serendipitous he he wanted to fly out and work with Kevin while we all still lived on the West Coast. So it was just kind of happenstance that that I ended up living an hour away from Kevin's studio. So that allowed us to to do the, do it that way and and you know not have to stay in hotels for 15 days or whatever to record with him. We I got to sleep in my own bed every night and you know everybody got to be comfortable and we just just commuted. So it worked out really well. And would you say that the sound on these two albums are consistent with what you guys have done in the past? Yeah, I think so. I think there's little differences here and there, and there's even differences between the two albums. Like we changed production techniques just a little bit between Anthronomicon and Helionomicon. There's, there's little differences here and there. I think the guitar has kind of a little, little bit scratchier of like a black metal sound to it while still being really heavier than, than our last albums have. And the bass is more audible. It's up in the mix a little bit more. It's a little bit grindier than our past albums. But overall, I don't think it. I don't think it sounds hugely different from our last two albums because we're basically a really easy band to record. Like we, we, we sound like we sound live on our albums. You know, it's not. There's not a lot of difference between what you hear at a live show and what you hear on our albums. So it's just a matter of like capturing it clearly. I'm curious, as far as like the, the subtle differences between these two albums, how would you compare them in terms of sound? I, I think they're very similar. Like I said, like, you know, there's little bits here and there. I think Justin like used a different snare drum on Helionomicon and Steve used a different bass on Helionomicon. So there was like little tiny things here and there, but I, I think it's much more, much more the composition that's the huge difference between the two albums. The the production differences are pretty minor and I think they're the sort of thing that you're only going to notice if you're the engineer or you're in the band or you're pay- paying really 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 close attention to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And tell me about Adam Tucker. Adam's another old friend of Justin's. He lives in Minnesota. He has a studio called Signature Tone. He's mastered all of our albums including our demo. He does an amazing job on on everything so yeah he's like the type of person where i was i was corresponding with him a lot in the mastering process because i was stuck at home maybe we'll get to this more later i was i was stuck at home for several months and corresponding with adam while he was mastering and he would he would send me something and if i heard if i heard something that sounded off 
I pointed out to him and he would send me the new version within like 15 minutes. You know, he's that, he's that type of dude that's like super on top of shit and, you know, doesn't, doesn't keep you waiting. He's right there and he does a great job. So yeah, I can't say enough good stuff about Adam. Adam's name comes up on this podcast from time to time. He works with a lot of the death metal bands in the Midwest, like Nothingness and Sunless. Mm -hmm. What would you say he brought to your sound? I think there's a real, like, there's, there's like a grit to our sound still. It sort of goes back to like the controlled chaos stuff we were talking about earlier. We try not to make our sound too clean or too produced sounding. And I think that he understands and respects that and leaves the grit on the music while still, you know, he, he gives it clarity, but he respects the dirt that, that we want to keep on it, if that makes sense.
so you said something about about corresponding with Adam while you were stuck at home. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I um I don't mind talking about it. This might get kind of rambly, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. But yeah, so I was right after right after we finished recording these albums last year, which was April of 2022, I was diagnosed with throat cancer in June, which was, it was kind of crazy because I, I started feeling the effects while I was recording the vocals for this album. I kind of got a sore throat that wouldn't go away. And then I was diagnosed with throat cancer like two months later. I went through treatment in August and September of last year and it was fucking gnarly. I, you know, I ended up in the hospital for eight days. I couldn't eat food. I couldn't drink. I couldn't talk for a while, but you know, the treatment appears to have worked and my prognosis is really good and it looks like the cancer has gone. I'm, I'm waiting on one last test in March to see. So things came out okay, but yeah, like pretty much right after we finished recording this album, things went downhill for me, but like, I don't know, it, it feels really, the whole cancer process feels really tricky linked to the two albums because, you know, even I did, I did a lot of work on the layout for these two albums and I was still, I was still working on the layout for both of these albums. Like the week, the week that I started radiation therapy, I was sick in bed, like in, in Photoshop, putting together layouts and stuff. So it, like the whole, the whole production of this album was really a kind of crazy journey for me, but yeah, things, things are looking good now. I do, I do feel a lot better. I'm, almost back to my old energy levels. The only, the only thing that hasn't fully recovered is my voice, which is a bummer. It means we can't really book any tours or play any shows yet, but it is, it is improving. I'm just waiting to see, you know, how long it's going to take. What did your doctor say about doing vocals and then getting to do vocals again? <laughs> well, that's, there's not really a good way to go to a doctor and be like, Hey, I'm in a death metal band. <laughs> when will I be able to do death growls again? There's no doctor that has a good answer for that. I went to a speech therapist and I asked her these questions and she basically just gave me advice and said, you know, run a humidifier in your room. Don't drink coffee. don't drink alcohol. I don't drink alcohol anyways. So, but the coffee was kind of tough. So I was just kind of, taking her advice and just seeing how it went. The good news is I just, I just scheduled an appointment with a new speech therapist at Johns Hopkins, which is a really, really great hospital. And she's a former opera singer, apparently. So there's probably no better speech therapist I could be going to, to, <laughs> to help me on my path to like being able to scream again. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to go into this too much. It's, it's all up to you and your, your comfort level. But I am curious, you know, this is... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wide open. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I, get, I, I don't mind talking about it. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a heavy, heavy diagnosis to be handed no matter what, you know, what stage of your life you're in. But, you know, while you're finishing up these two albums, what were your thoughts at the time? I mean, it's particularly like in as it pertains to the albums like well I, I guess i can't really talk about it without saying like my 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 entire outlook was like there was a moment there were several weeks almost a month where i all i had was a diagnosis and i knew that i knew that the cancer was in my throat but had spread to my lymph nodes they confirmed that much that i had that i had cancer and it was in my lymph nodes but I had to get something that was called a PET scan, which scans your entire body and detects cancer cells. So I didn't know if it had spread to other organs in my body. So there was like a couple weeks to like, I think it was like three weeks where I was waiting to find out if like, basically if like I was going to die or <laughs> if it was manageable. So like, Obviously that's a pretty fucking freaky place to be already in your mind. But that, that also made me think about like these albums and you know, the way, the way that I think about 
writing and recording music already. I mean, it sounds kind of lofty, but the way that I think about my music is like, this is my life's work and this is what I'm going to leave behind. If there's a world left after I'm gone, this is what I'm going to leave behind. And these albums specifically, I had to think of it like these, you know, these could be the last two albums I ever put out into the world. And am I okay with that? And the answer was, yeah, like I'm proud enough of these albums that like, I would be okay with these being the last two pieces of art that I put out into the world. And, you know, they were the final statements that I got to make before I passed on into the wild blue yonder, you know? So yeah, I mean, it's big, it's big ideas and it's scary shit to think about, but it also made me sort of like reflect on myself and on my art and on my music. And now I'm, going to think of every album I record like that. Am, am I going to be okay with it being the last thing I ever do? Because that's how you th should think about shit, you know, in, in your everyday life, I think. I mean, do you have, if, if we do think of each of these works as possibly the last thing that we put out into the world, do you have regrets about the previous albums? Is there anything you'd improve about those or change? Mm, I, I never really think about that. It, it, it's that's you know that's pointless to me like it, it's stuff that's finished and it's out in the world and i'm proud of it we're all we're all proud of every recording that we've done so I, i've never even thought about that actually like would i change anything because i can't so <laughs> i would rather move forward and figure out what the next thing is than than dwell on anything in the past i mean it's funny because not not funny haha but the two years that we went through through the pandemic you know especially those those first six months i spent a lot of time talking to bands who had albums coming out or had albums that were delayed you know because of the pandemic and this never really came up even though it was possibly something that we all could have faced you know this this any number of people that i spoke to including myself might have you know might have gotten corona and not come out of it and like in terms of leaving something behind i you know i feel like that's something that all musicians and all artists think about to a certain extent but with you i think it was very much present on your mind as you're finishing this up i yeah yeah sorry do you want to do you want to say anything no no i, I was just confirming what you said it was definitely at the front of my mind at, at the time and i had uh i had the drummer from voivod on the podcast and of course when when their guitarist died he left behind you know albums like plural worth of music for for the band to keep going was that on your mind at all did you want to i mean did you think about like what <laughs> what the next Ultharm album might be i mean obviously this was a very serious thing that you're dealing with at the time so that's probably mostly what you're focused on yeah i mean as soon as as soon as i started treatment which was radiation and chemotherapy which you know had me like for the large part bedridden for months and months and months the way i kept busy was by writing music you know my like my body was all fucked up but my hands worked fine is what i tell people because <laughs> so i basically like sat in my bed with an acoustic guitar and wrote music for months and i have I do have albums worth of material, nothing for Ulthar actually, for, for my other bands. Yes, I've written multiple albums and I'm, I'm about halfway, I was working on another solo album today, like before I got on this call, which was, it was all shit that I wrote while I was sick. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I did, <laughs> I did something similar. Like that was, that was how I kept myself busy was just like, making music you know even though it, it wasn't with other people it was just by myself but just creating music you know for for down the road like writing songs if it was you know just in guitar pro it was like i was writing songs for for future albums you know and i, I couldn't think of a better way to like stay productive while my body was like you know taking a shit for lack of a better term <laughs> and i know you mentioned that you have one more one more appointment one more set of tests but am I correct in saying that for the most part, the treatment has been successful? 
and your prognosis is good? Yeah. Yeah. The test that I'm taking in March is, and like I mentioned earlier that I took a PET scan, which is the full body scan to make sure that shit hasn't spread. It's another PET scan. And I actually took, I had a PET scan in December that was like the big one after the treatment to see if the treatment had worked. And it confirmed that yes, the treatment had worked. They saw a little bit of what they call signal around my lymph nodes, which is probably just, it's probably just remnants of the cancer that they killed with radiation basically. So the appointment in March is basically just to, con- just to confirm that what what the doctors already think, that, that it's gone, that it's okay, that I'd be it. it it's just to confirm that because the, the one in December was a little too soon after the treatment to be 100% accurate, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's intense, man. I'm sorry you had to go through this. Yeah, it was, it was fucking crazy. It was, it's even now, like, I do feel a lot better. I, I'm getting my energy back. I'm doing normal shit like I did before I got sick. It's, it's crazy to just think, like, wow, that happened to me. <laughs> that, that, like, you know, I, all that time I spent in the hospital and all the needles in my arms and all the crazy shit. I went through that, like that actually happened to me and, you know, the process of like telling everybody in my family, like, Hey, I have cancer. Like, I don't know how bad it is that that's something that actually happened to me that I went through. And it's, it's kind of a mind fuck that I'm even sitting here now talking about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I appreciate you being so open about this. I mean, I was thinking like, you know, from the point when I was, when I was in a band and I was doing vocals, my throat always hurt and, or it was always kind of scratchy. And so I, you know, I don't know if I would have noticed like if there was something wrong with my throat because it always kind of felt like shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. when, when did you realize that something was wrong or something was out of the ordinary? Well, like I said, it was, it stayed scratchy after I finished recording the vocals for like a month and a half. But it wasn't so bad that I thought I should like go to the doctor. I just had this really minor sore throat, which I thought was kind of weird. The, the point that I knew I had to go and get it checked out and get it biopsied was I, I was just walking down the street and I like felt my neck and I felt a lump in my neck, which was where, where it had spread to my lymph nodes. They were all swollen up. So I had like, I had a big lump in my neck and I was like, that's, that's not right. So yeah, I went, I went to urgent care like that day to get it checked out. It took another month to actually diagnose it, but that, that was the point that I knew I had to, I had to go see somebody about it. I mean, it sounds like you, you caught it in time. Yeah. I mean, by all, by all appearances, you know, every doctor I've seen has said like, you caught it early enough and treatment worked. And actually the, the type, the type of cancer that I had very commonly spreads to the lymph nodes, but it's very, very uncommon that it spreads any further than that which I wish I would have known that for the three weeks while I was waiting to find out if I had cancer all over my body. But yeah, I, 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 I'm very lucky. I feel very lucky that things have panned out the way, the way that they have. They could have been a lot worse.
outside of outside of your immediate family or cl- and close friends knew what you're going through oh a lot and <laughs> like i i'm i i do i do keep in touch with a lot of friends like 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 i said i moved i moved to washington dc just under two and a half two years ago between a year and a half and two years ago and you know most of my friends are back in california so i i keep in touch with all them i try to I try to stay current with everybody. I try to maintain my friendships and stuff. I don't, I'm not on social media. I really hate social media. So I kind of feel like I have to make an extra effort to, to keep in touch with my friends and family. So, yeah, I mean, I, I tried to tell everyone that would want to know the, what was going on, which was a long, long list of people. And, you know, I'm not the type of person that would have, you know, go on Facebook and make a fucking Facebook update about it or anything. That feels really, feels weird to me that people do it that way. Yeah. But that would mean that uh, fans of the band didn't know what you're going through, right? Yeah. I I don't think, I've talked about it in a couple interviews, but yeah, I mean, the band never put out a statement or anything like that. So I don't think, I don't think the average all our listener had any idea of what's going on and probably still doesn't unless they read interviews or whatever. And for the people who are listening to this, uh, is there anything you want to tell them? Thanks. Thanks for, for listening to my music and supporting all as a band. We, we try to be very, very honest and upfront about what we do and just create cool, interesting, unique music for ourselves, but also for, for people to just enjoy and if that's something that you dig check it out and thank you for if you if you've already checked it out and and dig what we do thank you for doing that i guess that's about it yeah and the albums are out now do you guys have plans beyond that for the rest of the year no like like i said we can't we can't really book tours right now because until my voice comes back we're definitely definitely excited about booking tours when when we can actually do that we just don't know when that when that'll be and we've talked about what we're going to do next recording wise but we haven't landed on any particular plan at this point we, we're not sure what we're going to do next we've joked about we've joked about like our next you know our next album is going to be like a a three song ep of like two chord punk songs <laughs> just because we're <laughs> so exhausted from from putting these two albums together but I don't know. Whatever we do, it's going to be something weird, interesting. I, I think that's that's all we know how to do. So, Anthronomicon and Helionomicon are out now through Twenty Book Spin. Shelby, how can people order the album? What's the best way to get them? Order the albums, I should say. They're they're both available through Twenty Book Spin, either twentybuckspin dot com or on Twenty Book Spin's Bandcamp. Do you want to say anything about the the physical releases that Twenty Book Spin are putting out? The limited vinyl and stuff like that each album has i think i think three different vinyl variants and i think that they're mostly still in stock well i'm not sure but yeah i think 20 bucks spins pretty notorious for throw pretty vinyl and this is this is no different he's he's done some really cool really cool shit with with the packaging and stuff and if people want to follow Ulthar online what's the best way to do that it just just Google Ulthar band. I don't, I don't really know. I don't run our social media or anything, so I don't know what our... I think it's like at Ulthar underscore Oakland, even, which is funny because two of us don't live in Oakland anymore. But yeah, you, you, can, you can, if you're interested, you can Google, you'll find us. But you should quit social media. <laughs> you should quit social media, but I'll have links to the social media pages on... The website yeah if you insist on having social media that's where you can find us <laughs> actually do you want to expand on that i i'm mostly ambivalent about social media if i didn't have to use it i would not use it at all you know and as somebody who like rarely speaks to people in my <laughs> in my actual everyday life it, it i don't really feel the need to correspond with people over social media but um, i'm curious what your thoughts are Oh, I mean, to put it as simply as possible, like I, 
I used to have social media. Maybe I, I think I quit like five or six years ago. Every time I went on social media, it made me feel depressed or anxious. It made me feel bad about my friends. It made me feel bad about other people. And my quality of life has improved a lot without having that shit in my life. So, I mean, really put really simply, I just, I'm happier without that shit in my life. And I think it makes people act really weird. And I think it's kind of like tearing at the seams of society in some, some gross ways. So I just prefer to not be involved with it. I mean, originally I, I thought social media is, you know, kind of seeing sides of people that, that you didn't know they had or people would act in a way feel emboldened to act in a way online that they wouldn't act if you were face to face but now I'm starting to notice and maybe this was just the job that I had and working with much younger people I'm starting to see that like kind of the douchiness and abrasiveness of the way people act online is is becoming a day to day thing in their their personal and work lives and it feels like politeness, <laughs> just the basic act of like, you know, having a civil conversation is is slowly being eroded. I don't know. But I'm an old man who complains about a lot of things. So maybe that's just my, my cynicism. Yeah, no, I, 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 I am too. And I feel the exact same way. Like the, people, people have lost the ability to like deal with other human beings in a face to face human way. Like people have learned to communicate through a screen and you know there's no there's no empathy there's no sympathy like that's it's it's taking away our humanity you know what makes us human and that's that's what i find so fucking scary about it yeah so you were open and very generous with your time on a lot of topics but is there anything else you want to say before we close up no i've said it all that's it last will and testament <laughs> Right. Well, hopefully not. Right. <laughs> and you know what? If I if I if I die if I die in my sleep tonight, I'll rest well knowing that this was the last the last podcast I ever did. Oh Jesus Christ! Don't put that don't put that weight on me. <laughs> I know. I'm just fucking. <laughs> Thanks, Shelby. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your time too.